was particularly challenging for law enforcement because the rapist was concealing his identity from the victims. He wasn't leaving behind any fingerprints and he constantly changed locations. A phantom rapist is on the loose in Polk County, Florida. He carefully masks his identity and seems to disappear without a trace. Based on our experience, when a rapist strikes this close together and the victims are only days apart, he's probably picked his next victim and he's likely to strike again and soon. But he may be leaving behind clues that investigators just aren't seeing. Florida has always been considered a peaceful place, at least during the day. But the nighttime is different. In the pre-dawn hours, a predator is prowling the streets. At 4 a.m. in house number 139, a woman is awakened by a strange man next to her bed. He covers her face with a towel, threatens her with a knife, and sexually assaults her. Then he escapes through the window. Terrified that he will return, the victim waits three hours before calling 911. Polk County Detective Gloria Williams is assigned to the case. I was dispatched about 6.30 a.m. into this neighborhood, and it was a report of a sexual assault and battery on a female in her residence. She was surprised by a perpetrator, and the perpetrator uh, concealed his face to her. The first thing Detective Williams wants to know is how the perpetrator got into the house. The victim reported that the door was locked, and she knows it was secure, so there was some other method of entry made here. So I walked around the house and looked for another point of entry and found a screen removed and an unlocked window. It's very easy to surprise the victim when it's an experienced person going into the window and catching the victim off guard. Another clue convinces Detective Williams that she's dealing with an experienced criminal. I found the victim's purse lying on the ground. The contents were scattered, so the perpetrator very likely went through this and gathered any change, any money he could find in the purse, and didn't leave any fingerprints. This would mean that he more than likely covered his hands. The rapist may be covering up his face and his fingerprints, but he's still leaving a trace of himself behind. We were able to collect DNA evidence in this case because there was a sexual assault. However, we don't have a suspect to compare the evidence to, so it didn't lead us anywhere at that time. With no concrete leads and no way to identify a suspect, the race is on to catch the phantom predator before he strikes again. But just three nights later, a few blocks away from the first victim's residence, another woman awakens to find a strange man in her bedroom. When the call came in, it was just what I feared. He broke into a residence, went in through a window, covered the victim's eyes so she couldn't see him and recognize him, and stole change out of her purse, threatened her with a screwdriver, and sexually assaulted her. This attacker uses a screwdriver instead of a knife in the assault. But there is a striking similarity between the two cases. Both perpetrators concealed their identity and left no fingerprints behind. Fortunately, the second victim calls the police immediately. Deputy Roger Dennis and his canine partner Fritz arrive at the house within minutes after the attack. I was dispatched to the victim's residence of a burglary and sexual battery. I was told by the deputies already at the scene that the suspect may have entered or exited the front window of the house. I took the dog to that location to pick up a scent. The canine quickly signals that he's identified an unfamiliar smell and wants to track it. 
Fritz picked up the scent at the window and followed across the front yard to the roadway and down the street, at which time he lost the scent on the pavement. It's as if the perpetrator has simply vanished. With two unsolved attacks on her hands, Detective Williams analyzes both incidents, but she finds she has more questions than answers. These were really difficult cases. As a matter of fact, we really didn't know we, we were dealing with the same offender because a different weapon had been used. With one or more perpetrators still at large, investigators need immediate help. They call on criminal profiler Dale Hinman, hoping she can shed some light on the assaults before another woman is attacked. Everyone who's involved in the investigation of violent crime plays a very important role in the investigation, but each person does something different. The profilers come to the scene to analyze the behavioral clues. Knowing that there is no time to lose, Agent Hinman heads to Polk County to meet with detectives and visit the crime scenes. Based on our experience, when a rapist strikes this close together and the victims are only days apart, he's probably picked his next victim and he's likely to strike again and soon. Based on the information that this offender was gaining entry so easily into these residences and he was covering his face so that he concealed his identity, he was covering his hands so he wasn't leaving fingerprints, we thought that he probably had a prior criminal history for burglary or other property crimes. Hinman suggests that investigators contact neighboring jurisdictions looking for similar attacks. And the results of the search shock everyone. When I started investigating these cases, I determined through other cities in Polk County that they were having additional sexual assaults, 20 to 30 in the last three and a half year period. And they were very similar. If all 30 assaults were committed by the same man, investigators have a serial rapist on the loose it now appears he's an even more experienced criminal than they originally thought. At this point, we're really alarmed by this individual because he's becoming more aggressive and more compulsive. He's raping almost every seven to 10 days. We needed to really apprehend him as soon as possible. He was becoming more dangerous. Since the last attack was four days ago, the rapist could strike again any day. Special Agent Hinman and Florida Department of Law Enforcement Agent Wayne Porter meet with Detective Williams to go over the new cases. Is this all the work of a single man? First, they look at where the crime scenes took place. Well, he could remain in these areas because they represent comfort zones to him because he's lived in those areas or worked there, and so he's very familiar with the neighborhoods and he knows how to get in and get out without being detected. That's, that's a good point. Actually, in all of these jurisdictions, we're seeing clusters of a hit. He's hitting several residences in the same area and then moves directly to another area. By changing jurisdictions, he may think that police are not sharing information about these rapes and aren't able to actually link the assaults together. There is also a striking similarity in the victims he chooses. Well, it seems that he knows who's going to be in the house and he knows which houses are easy to break into so he must be spending a lot of time in these neighborhoods there are women and children in the homes but there's no men in the homes sounds like surveillance doesn't it It really does it, it seems like he's sitting and watching these homes for the opportunity or for selection of the victims or for waiting for the opportunity for the man to be gone to commit the crime Hinman believes the perpetrator is an experienced burglar moving through areas familiar to him He's also methodical, checking out each location to make sure there's no man in the house when he strikes. But before they can put the profile into action, there is another attack. I received a call early one Saturday morning of a victim that was confronted in a residence. She was asleep on the sofa with her five-year-old daughter. The television had still been playing. He came in and he unplugged the TV. This startled her. She realized he was there and instinctively wanted to protect her five-year-old daughter. But this assault doesn't follow the usual pattern. She fought back, and they struggled, and she was stabbed in the hand with the scissors. The perpetrator flees the scene, but not before something happens that's never happened before. 
she had in the struggle actually got a chance to see his face, which is something we didn't have before. She was able to remember the long, stringy blonde hair and high cheekbones. She provided this information to the police, which aided in doing a composite. With a solid description in hand, a computer sketch artist pieces together the suspect's face. Basically, I would ask the victim to look at the pictures and to pick out one that they thought looked most like the person's nose or the person's eyes. And we could try all of them if they needed to till they found one that was close. One by one, the perpetrator's features emerge, but no one can be sure this is the man responsible for dozens of assaults. In all of the cases that we looked at so far, the offender threatened the victims with a sharp instrument, but no one was actually cut. This is the first case that we saw where the victim sustained a cutting injury, but then the subject fled. So was this the same man, and was he there for the same reason? Coming up next, is this the face of the phantom rapist? When another woman in Polk County, Florida is attacked in her home, investigators believe it may be the work of the phantom rapist. A police artist builds a computer-generated composite of the man's face. When we're finished, typically what we do is ask them a percentage as to how much the composite looks like the suspect. If it is more than 50%, then that means it gets distributed. But if this latest attack was committed by a different perpetrator, then the clue they've waited so long to get could be useless. Agent Hinman meets with Detective Williams to compare the different cases. He climbed through this window and he expected the victim to be sleeping on this bed. And there were no lights on there, so he couldn't tell that until he got in and found that she wasn't there. He finds her in the living room on the couch with her, her child. And so she hears him and he confronts her. The victim mm -hmm. fights back. Maybe her maternal instincts are taking over, but she's fighting back. Although what happened in this attack varied from the others in its outcome, both investigators believe that the perpetrator was following a similar M.O. to the other cases. A late night entry through a window into a house where no man was present. Very often people think that when a serial offender is committing a crime, he's going to do it exactly the same way every time. Mm -hmm. But things were different in this case because she wasn't in the bedroom. He confronted her in the living room and she woke up before he had an opportunity to wake her up. Basically, the crime is the same. And he probably, in this particular case, was there for the same purposes, for the robbery, for the sexual assault, and then he would leave under his terms. But in this case, he left under her terms. Exactly. Agent Hinman concludes that this latest attack is indeed the work of the same perpetrator, only now he has a face. Investigators immediately release the drawing to the media, who dubbed the attacker the Southside Rapist. And soon, the tips begin to pour in. We found several men who had committed burglaries, and based on what the profilers told us, these were the individuals we started looking at. We actually found one individual who met the physical description somewhat and had committed a burglary in the area. And he had a traffic warrant on him, so we picked him up and took him to the station. Investigators have collected DNA evidence from several of the crime scenes. What they need now is a DNA sample from their new suspect, they use a standard police technique to get it. You secrete your blood type in your saliva and body fluids. We provided him a cigarette and allowed him to smoke it. And then we collected the cigarette, but we rushed it to the Tampa Crime Lab and had it analyzed. Detectives have the DNA sample they need, but the lab results aren't what they'd hoped. We were able to look at the body fluid evidence from this individual and eliminate him because he did not match what we already had based on the assaults that we had previously investigated. With their prime suspect now cleared, investigators are forced to play a waiting game. Agents Hinman and Porter decide to revisit the Polk County neighborhood where the most recent attack took place. They need to devise a new strategy to catch the phantom. Well, 
you notice even with the heavy coverage by police and the media, he's still committing these assaults. So he's not going to stop. Absolutely until he's not. Caught. They're sure the rapist will strike again soon, but to catch him, they need to know where to look. I think that one of the reasons why you have so much movement in this series of attacks is because the police basically flooded the area and doing surveillance. He's moving as a result of the really increased police presence in the communities. In short, the rapist is avoiding areas where he sees an unusual number of police cars. Agents need to design a new, less obvious strategy to identify potential suspects. I think that what the police should do at this point is a much more covert type of, uh, of surveillance as opposed to a, a more increased police presence. We should spend more time looking for a vehicle that's parked on the side of the road as opposed to somebody who's walking or driving in the area. So maybe a place where a car has been parked and there's evidence that a person's just been sitting around. Yeah. And also that time would, would help him build up his nerve to go and commit uh, the assault. So uh, I would agree with that. Investigators comb the streets looking for signs of someone conducting surveillance on Polk County neighborhoods. Just two nights later, officers in the quiet neighborhood of Pine Lake Estates spot a suspicious car parked off the road in a wooded area. On closer observation of the car, they found cigarette belts scattered outside one of the doors and found pornographic magazines on the front seat of the car. Could this be the surveillance vehicle of the Southside Rapist? This was just the type of sign we were hoping for. We expected this rapist to sit somewhere in the area for long periods of time, just looking and watching and waiting, trying to find his next victim. Officers at the scene run the car's plates and discover it belongs to a man named Barry Dyson, who closely resembles the composite drawing. Canine officer Roger Dennis arrives on the scene and decides to put a risky plan into action. We knew that the suspect had been breaking in, into some homes over in this direction. Officer Dennis and his dog hide in the grass, waiting for the driver to return. Have they finally trapped the phantom rapist? Coming up next on Body of Evidence. <laughs> Officers on a surveillance operation track a suspicious vehicle to a man named Barry Dyson. Could he be the phantom rapist? Barry Dyson fit our profile. He had a history for burglary. He lived in the area, and his car was parked in a position where he could watch the area and wait for the appropriate time to commit another assault. An officer and his police dog take up a surveillance position near the car in an overgrown field. We figured he would pass through this pasture, and since the vehicle and the suspect fit the profile, Fritz and I position, position ourselves in the weeds here, waiting for him to walk by. Hours go by. Then Dennis spots a man heading in his direction. After a while, we saw him walking across the pasture, smoking a cigarette. When he got close to me, I identified myself as a deputy sheriff and ordered him to stop. He began to run, and I unleashed Fritz. And with a matter of seconds, he had him on the ground. Dennis arrests Dyson for failing to heed a lawful police order. But at the station, investigators start to question him about the string of sexual assaults. We saw the person who would commit this type of crime as being a very insecure type of person. So if the interview approached him from a very gentle and understanding and almost sympathetic type of way, perhaps he would confess to all of the crimes that he had committed and the strategy works. Barry Dyson confessed to several cases where he gave me the instances of how he behaved in the house. And based on what the victims had already provided us in interviews, it confirmed that Barry Dyson was the Southside rapist. Dyson is charged with 42 counts of armed sexual battery, armed burglary, and aggravated battery. But while awaiting trial, Barry Dyson attempts a dramatic escape from the Polk County Jail 
and is shot and killed by guards. The case of the phantom rapist is closed for good. Here was an individual who terrorized dozens of women in their own home. He concealed his identity. He wore gloves. He thought he would never be caught. He was wrong. Barry Dyson will never harm them or anyone else again.